That's a good one that didn't get away. I love that picture, that's a good one. But, um, so now you have to manage them. You've made them up, and now you have to manage them. And the biggest thing you're managing for is that they don't swarm, because they're going to want to swarm. You don't want to stay in that little box. So how do you do that? Well, like I said before, you can make additional nukes. You can pull brood and bees out of the nukes and put them in new nuke boxes and give them queens. And you can put foundation back or comb back in the nukes where you remove the brood and they'll draw out the foundation. Nucleus colonies. I think nucleus colonies draw foundation out better than any other setup. Better than production colonies. They really want worker brood. They don't want drone comb. They want worker comb. You ought to see these things when they're strong and you're on a flow. Draw out frames of foundation. <clears throat> One time, I was years ago, Tony Jente came over from Maine to see what I was doing. So I was out in the bee yard at yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning and I'm adjusting, I'm, I'm manipulating my nukes. And I'm taking them, they're so strong, I'm removing two frames of brood and I'm putting in two frames of foundation. You know, a foundation against the divider and two cones of brood and bees and another foundation against the wall. At 10 o'clock in the morning, he came at 4. We went out back out to the bee yard to see what they were doing. The foundation was already, already drawn out this far. And there were eggs. <laughs> there were eggs. There was a, a, an eighth of an inch cell wall and eggs in the cells. And they were, I swear, they were drawing the, the they were drawing the, the foundation out as the brood was there. They're amazing. They really like to draw foundation. So this is an, this is kind of how I drop my nukes, you know. A lot of them, a lot of them in one place, and they, it doesn't matter. I usually alternate the the entrances. This entrance has them facing this way. This entrance is facing that way. This entrance that way. This way. And they do very well that way, right next to each other, right in a production. I'm, st I'm standing in the production yard taking the picture. So there's 25 production colonies right here. And there's 50 nucleus colonies right there. You can use that brood, right? If you don't want to make more nucleus colonies, you can use that brood for bee bombs. You know, here it is. You know, July or August, and these things are getting really strong, and you need to take brood out of them to, to slow them down. You put that brood in a box, and you take it over to a colony in your yard that needs some help, and you put it on the bottom board, you put seven frames of brood and two empty combs, that's nine or three, however you have ten, and you put your, your colony back on top, and they explode. So that's another thing you can do with the brood. You can put a queen excluder on top of a double nuke box. As long as the queen can't cross over the divider, as long as the, the screen from the excluder is touching the divider, the queens can't cross over. It doesn't matter if the bees cross over. The bees get along just fine. They don't fight. They don't go after the other nuke's queen. They fill the super. They work together, filling the super. You know, why don't they fight? Doesn't it seem like they would fight? They don't fight. They don't attack the other, other nukes queen. <coughs> Brother Adam says that it's not, when you try to introduce a queen to a hive, it's not about the smell of that queen. It's whether that queen is a lady queen or not. When you try to requeen a hive with a caged queen, is that queen a laying queen? That queen is not a laying queen. She was a laying queen until they put her in a cage. Now she's been in a cage for a few days. She's no longer a laying queen. She doesn't act like a laying queen. And so you have to do it the way where you pull the candy cork and all that. Brother Adam, what does he do? He wants to requeen that hive over there. He goes over to his mating nuke. He pulls the queen out. Puts her in a cage to transport her. He goes over there, he pulls the old queen out of the hive that wants to be requeened. He 
puts her in a cage so he can transport her. He opens the cork and lets the laying queen walk into the queen, into the hive that he's going to requeen, that he just pulled the old queen out of. He takes the old queen, he goes back to the mating zoo, he opens the cork and he lets the queen run into the mating zoo. No candy, no confinement, they're laying queens. They were just taken out of mating them. So it has no, nothing to do with, oh, that queen doesn't smell like our queen. It has to do with whether she's a laying queen or not. Another example, when I, when I catch my last round of queens, I have these four-way mating nukes. And on each side of the central divider are two nukes with a, with a feeder between them. And they're just little frames. You know, I pull one of those queens out and cage her and use her somewhere. I pull the feeder up. As soon as I find that queen, I pull the feeder up. I slide her four combs over against the other queen's four combs, and I put the feeder over here. Do I lose any queens? I don't lose any queens. So obviously, that note doesn't care about, those bees don't care about that queen. It's a lady queen, they accept her immediately. So they don't fight. When you want to take that honey super off, you remove the honey super, you put a triangular bee escape right on top of the queen excluder, and you put the super back on top, and the bees go down through the triangular bee escape into whichever group they want to go. And they don't fight. And they don't all go to one, and they get along just fine. Only trouble is, there's no honey in the brood nest, in the brood nest because all the honey has been put up in the honey super. So now you got four cones of brood down in the brood nest with zero honey. So you got way too much brood and you got zero honey. So I stopped doing this because I didn't think it was a very good idea. Because then you have to feed the heck out of them and you got this enormous colony hanging out the entrance, building comb on the outside of the box because they're so huge. <clears throat> you can expand the colony if you had an extra nuke box, you could remove one of the nucleus colonies and put it in the other nuke box and move the feeders over to one side and give four empty combs to that queen, to that nuke. And now you have two eight frame nukes. And that slows warming down because you just gave four combs. But taking through the winter, you know, you have, say you have honey in all these combs here. And then here's your cluster, and they start some brew, and it gets really cold, and they don't want to move over there. Because bees don't like to move horizontally, they like to move vertically. Which is one of the real reasons why I don't like top bar hives. Because bees don't like to move sideways. They will move sideways if they have to, if they're able to, but in real cold weather they're not able to. So they'll sit over here and start with it. Plus, you need twice as much equipment. If you're going to expand them sideways into another new box, you need another new box. You need a bar and a box and a feeder and a bag and a cover. So it takes twice as much equipment to move them sideways. Well, suppose, why don't you think up? Bees think up. That's all bees do is they think up. Everything is up. Everything is expanding up. <clears throat> so think up. Think like a bee. Bees make better beekeepers than beekeepers make bees. <laughs> so, so observe what bees do. Learn from what bees do. And imitate what bees do. And that's successful beekeeping. That's how you become a successful beekeeper. You observe what bees do. You learn from what they do. And you imitate what they do. They don't move sideways. They move up. Well, if they move up, why don't we just add some supers? Not 10 frame supers, four frame supers. Little skinny nuke box supers like that. So if we have a solid divider in our double nuke box, right there is the divider, and we have two supers that met, that came together right where the divider is. Now you've got nuke, a nuke that's got eight combs, but it's got eight combs vertical not horizontally. <coughs> and if you do that early enough in the season, you just have these nucleus colonies draw out four frames of foundation. When you put that 
that nucleus colony with eight cones in a, in a ten frame box, half the cones are new. Wow, well, didn't that work easy? You're here trying to rotate the cones and you're trying to you know, figure out a way to, to get new cones in your hive. What a good way to get new cones in your hive. They love to move up. Now, if I was going to keep these here in Virginia, where it gets so hot in the summertime, there's a real problem with single-story nukes. They get so hot that they don't like to be in that box, and they abscond. You know what absconding is? Absconding is not swarming. You know, with swarming, the bees build queen cells. When the queen cells are ready, they take off with the queen and they fly around the bee yard. <clears throat> they land on a bush, and they find a new spot. Absconding is different. Absconding, they don't make queen cells. They just say, what the heck are we doing here? And they leave. And they fly away with the queen, and they don't even circle in the bee garden. They come out of, that, out of that new box like an arrow. They come out, out like an arrow, over the trees and gone. I, I mean, I stand, stood there and watched them. It takes about two minutes. And they all come pouring out over the trees and gone. Gone. Never cluster, never, never hang out or anything. And they leave no queen cells behind. <clears throat> so now there's a few young bees left with all the brood, and they, they valiantly try to <clears throat> make emergency cells, which never seem to make it, and they've lost all their strength. And in my area, when I find ones that have sconded, I just say the heck with it. I don't feed them for winter, I don't do anything, I just let them die. Because they're not going to make it through the winter, because they've lost all their strength. <clears throat> Last summer we had uh, we had some pretty hot weather. You know, I mean, I laugh about your lack of snow. Well, you can laugh at me about my lack of heat. We had uh, two two hot spells, two heat spells. A heat spell in Vermont is three days over ninety. <laughs> yeah, wow. I said that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the whole the whole crowd cracked up. But we had we had two heat hot spells with three days or more over 90, it actually was 95. And that's all it took, and they were gone. So the nucleus colonies that I made between July 11th and July 26th, 75% of them absconded in that heat in August. The nucleus colonies that I made between June 15th and July 11th, I expanded up into two stories, like this. Not one of them absconded. So what I'm saying is, I think you should make your nucleus colonies earlier, when there's still a flow on, so you can expand them up onto a foundation and get them to draw your four frames of foundation out. So I don't know when that is for you. I don't know when the flow ends, or when the period of, of drawing foundation for you is, when that ends. I think you want to make your nukes well before that, so you can get them into two stories and they won't abscond, and they won't swarm as readily. You know, I start making nukes in the middle of June, and, and two weeks later, I go back and pull the cage. Ten days later, I go back and pull the cage and check to see if they have a lay queen. And then two weeks later, I go back and make sure they're not getting too crowded, and I adjust them if they're getting too crowded. But every four days, we're catching 80 queens. And so every four days we're making, every week we're making, you know, 50 more nukes. So by the time the middle of July comes, I got 350 nukes out there that have to be adjusted. I got queens to catch every four days. I got more nukes to make every four days because I'm, I'm, we're trying to get up to 500. And pretty soon I don't have enough time to go back and check those ones that I made up a few weeks ago, and there they go. So it gives you a lot more leeway in what you do. It gives you more time. And I really like this idea. And you know what? I don't have to move these nucleus colonies to the top of the hive for winter. Because with an upper entrance, they're sitting on an empty box. That's an empty hive body that's no good for anything except for a hive stand. And then you got your bottom nuke, double nuke box, and then you got your two supers. And if there's an upper entrance drilled right there, that is usually above the snow line. So they have an upper entrance that they can fly from 
if they get a twenty flight day. Well, that's why I moved them to the top of the hive so it'll be out of the snow on a cleansing flight day. They're already out of the snow on a cleansing flight day, so I don't have to move them. Of the 236 nukes that I expanded up and I wintered, I lost five. And the ones that are left, they're like this now. They're amazing. They're just so packed with these. So I, I'm kind of liking this better. I just made another hundred something of these little nucleus colonies, and I'm going to start going away from the movable feeder. I'm going to start getting rid of my movable feeders. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to cut a piece of, of aluminum flashing that's about this long, and I'm going to bend the ends over so it looks like a U, an upside down U, and I'm going to slide that right down on top of the feeder, on the top of the two feeder holes, on the holes on top of that feeder. And now it's going to be like a solid divider. And I'm going to put my two nuke boxes on, my two little nukes on top, my supers. And they'll touch, they'll push that, that metal down against the feeder, and then these won't be able to cross over. So this year I'm going to have 350 of these instead of 230 or whatever. I think it's a better idea, especially where you have a hot summer. They're, uh, you know, a, a new box, I mean, a standard size box is what? 16 and a quarter. So if you made two supers, one, they're each eight, eight and eight, it's going to fit. It's going to fit your, your cover, it's going to fit everything. So think about that. <clears throat> one good thing about nucleus colonies is you can evaluate the queen without devoting a whole lot of equipment to that queen. You know, if you were gonna if you were gonna requeen a hive and then you wanted to evaluate that queen, you know, you've got 20 or 30 frames devoted to that queen. And if she's a dud, you devoted 20 or 30 combs to a dud. If it's in a new box, you only got four or eight combs there. So you've got very few resources, equipment resources devoted to each queen. And you know, the queens react the same. Their, their performance in a nuke box is the same as their performance in a big hive, only in miniature. So a pattern, you can see the pattern is nice. You can see whether they get chalk root. You can see whether they're mean. So all the things that you evaluate your queens in a standard size hive, you can do the same thing in a nuke box. So you've got your queens, you've got your nukes made up, you got your queens laid, and here comes the winter. And that's another one, that's those are three story colonies. After an ice storm, we had this massive ice storm in 1998. I mean, it melted, it melted those big metal electric high tension lines, you know, those big metal towers, they folded them like they were made out of clay. I didn't lose one of the eyes. But they looked like this. I mean, there was branches down on them, they were covered with ice and snow. But bees have been living on the edge of the ice sheet for the last 10,000 years. So they can, they can handle the cold. So the first thing you have to do to prepare them for winter is to make sure they have enough food to eat. They have to have enough food to eat, or they'll starve to death in the winter. So you can feed them using your division board feeder if you use these division board feeders. But you can't put very much in there. You can only put about five pounds of syrup or something in one of those, if there's no comb built. If there's comb built, you can hardly put anything in there. You can put maybe a quart in. So if they needed uh, 15 pounds of beef and you fed them with quartz, you're going to be going back to your beehive a lot of times. I can't do that. I can't go back. I've got 35 yards. I can't be going. I got 500 nukes. I can't be going back there every few days to put, fill up that quart container or to fill up that that feeder. <clears throat> so I use contact feeders with holes punched in the cover turned upside down on top of the frames. So you can fold the bag back 
put the can on top of the on top of the frames where they're exposed, put a shell around it, put a cover on it. And they do very well taking the syrup down like that. They don't cross over, they don't fight with each other. <clears throat> or you had nukes with little inner covers. You can feed them through the inner cover hole. Put some shims on top of the inner cover and put some gallon cans. I like gallon cans because those hold a lot more. And you put the gallon can on top of the, the shims and you and you fix it so that there's a a box around each can like that. See, this is a funny one. <clears throat> this one, this one was a good strong one and it expanded up onto two. This one never never made it. They never drew out their foundation. They're still okay as far as a single story, but they never drew out their foundation. So what do I do? How do I winter this one? I put that empty box on there like that and I feed them that way. And then I take the can off and I take the whole, close the feeder hole down there and I fill this halfway with wood shavings. And that's how I winter that one. <clears throat> but I don't like them. I don't like feeding can uh, syrup when you fold the bag back. Because in order for the cluster to get over there to that can, they have to break the cluster to go over there to that can. And if the weather is cold, they won't go over there to that can. But when the can is directly on top of the cluster, they're in contact with the can. It's a contact feeder. They're right there. They don't have to go anywhere. It's right there. They just suck the syrup out and put it in the cells. You, put, you cut holes in the bags, and you put some shims like uh, Broken snow fence. That's a piece of broken snow fence. You know, that's a probably a shim I got on my table saw, a little three eighths inch big piece of wood. You can use sumac, little sumac branches. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you got enough space underneath the can so the bees can get under it. And you put the cans on it, and you put an empty box around it, and you cover it. So that's how I feed. So how much do you feed? You feed them until they won't take any more? You've heard that before, right? How much do you feed your bees? You feed them until they won't take any more. You fill every comb, every cell in that nuke, in that four or five frame nuke box, you fill it with, with feed for the winter. <clears throat> this is a uh, drawing from the hive of the honeybee of the winter cluster. Now, the graphic, let's see. These are these are cell, these are combs of honey. That graphic. These are these are combs with pollen stored in them. You see where the cluster is, the, de the dotted line. The dotted line is the cluster. <coughs> so here's honey. Is it full? Is everything full of honey? Do you see this? Do you see this area of the brood nest? The central area of the brood nest. <clears throat> you see that? That's a, those are pictures of bees in the cell head first. This is called clustering space. This is their clustering space. In the winter time, bees need empty comb space to cluster in. This is how they regulate the temperature, the internal temperature of the brood nest, by by regulating how many bees are in those cells. And how many empty cells? Do you see the empty cells? There's two empty cells there. There's three right there. There's another one up there. See the empty cells? Did you ever see a hive that starved in them? Of course. Where are the bees? They're in the cells head first, dead, right? Do you think they, they crawled in there and died? No, they didn't crawl in there and die. They were in there already because that's where they clustered. They don't cluster in strips of bees. They have, some of them do, of course. But the whole thing is in strips of bees between combs of honey. It's actually a ball of bees, and they're in the combs at the same time as around as between the combs. <clears throat> and they need that clustering space. So you don't want to feed them until they have every cell in the in the new full. Same with production line. You don't want to fill, feed them so much that every home space in the hive is full of feed. They need clustering space. So to show you what I do, I took pictures of four homes in a four-frame nuke. 
starting at the outside comb against the outside surface of the outside comb against the outside wall and working in towards the divider. So this is the first comb against the outside wall. This is a this is a uh, new box that's got the entrance on the side. So the entrance would be right here somewhere. You see? They never put it in here at the entrance. So the entrance is right about here. They're starting to cap it. Do you see these cells? Can you see the shine of all the liquid that's in those cells? So this frame is almost full. It just needs a little more and it needs to be capped. I look through the new box one frame at a time and I pull it out and I look at it and I say, how much, how much feed do I need to feed this colony so that that comb will be feed, filled? How much more feed does that comb need, this side need to be filled? Well, how much honey does a frame hold? A deep frame holds about six pounds, six and a half pounds, something like that. So we'll just for grains, we'll say six pounds. So if it was totally empty, this side would need three. But it's not totally empty. So let's say it's only half, it's only half empty. So it needs a pound and a half. And then we go to the next side of that comb, and you see it's full. So it doesn't need any. So to fill this frame up, we need a pound and a half or say two pounds. You know, it does shrink. Two to one syrup shrinks. Two to one syrup is 33% water. Honey is what? 18%? So they gotta get rid of some water, so it's gonna shrink. So rather than say, you know, a pound and a half, let's call it two pounds. And then you go to the second comb. You see where the last root emerged? And they put the false love. Here's where the last of the brood was. And when it emerged, they filled it up with the fall honey flow. And here they're still filling it, but they're capping it here. It's almost filled here. So how much would that one need? I don't know. Let's call it a pound. So now we're up to three pounds. And what about this is the other side of the second column? Now you're starting to see some empty cells. So let's say it needs, if it needed three to fill the whole thing, and maybe it needs a pound and a half to fill all that. So let's call it two pounds again. So now what are we at? Two, four, five pounds? I think something like that. Do you see where they're putting pollen in there? There's a pollen that they're storing for next year, next spring. So now we're up to five pounds. Oops, now we're getting into the center of the brood nest. <clears throat> see where the last of the brood is. We're going to want to fill, we want the cluster space to be in comb three and four, and we want it to look about like this. About this much cluster space on comb three and four. So we need to fill up this, all this right here, and leave that open. So what that's maybe it's got a pound in it, and it takes three, so maybe it's a couple pounds, or a pound and a half again, so now we're up to six and a half or seven. And the other side is a little same, it needs even a little bit more. So that means, that means at least two. So if we were seven, now we're up to nine. And if we go to the fourth column, it's the same as the third one, even a little bit more. So maybe we need two there again. So now we're up to 11. And you go to the next side, the inside against the divider, and it's got even less. So now we're up to nine, we're up to maybe 11. Well, a gallon is 10. So this thing needs at least a gallon. And I would probably feed this one a gallon and a half because it shrinks. So you can feed it a gallon, and then you can look at it again and see how, how it did and how it started. And it should cap it. They will cap the syrup. And once they ripen it, they'll cap it. So I'm going to write, I'm going to write down 1.5 on the outer cover of this nuke. means I'm going to give it a gallon and a half. So I, fill it, I, I feed it a gallon and a half, and then I check it again. And what do I see? This is column number four, I guess the divider, and there's my clustering space. And column, column number three, on this side of it, will have a smaller clustering space, and column one and two will be full. 
So that's what you need. You need about three and a half columns of feed in a four frame move box to get them through my winter. So where's the clustering space? The clustering space is right here. Where's the pollen? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, aren't they smart? Aren't they smart? Where are they going to be in the spring? Where's the pollen going to be in the spring? They're on their pollen. They're amazing. They, they know just what to do. Damn, they're good bees. They're better beekeepers than we are. <clears throat> so you need clustering space. So don't overfeed your complete colonies. Feed them so they have a clustering space. So now you have to come up with a winter location. And as I said, I put my single story nucleus colonies on top of production hives so they'll be up out of the snow. We have so many of them that we just, you know, we have to pick a day in November when it's a cool, kind of a cold day and it's a drizzly day, it's a day in the 40s and maybe it's sprinkly and they're not going to fly. So we can pick them up and put them on the truck and they're not going to come pouring out of the new boxes. It's funny about bees, if you smoke them before you pick them up and then you put them on the truck and you leave the truck running, the vibrations from the vehicle make the bees stay in. They won't come out hardly at all, as long as that vibration from the truck is going. You turn the truck off, out they come. <laughs> so we move them all on in a day or two. We put them on top of the outer covers and then we come back later to wrap them. We take the outer covers off and pile them up on, in the yard somewhere and we put the nuke box right on top of the inner cover. The new boxes have a solid bottom board and they go right on top of the inner cover. There's no communication between the two. There's no screen bottom on the, on the new box. You don't, there's, the feed hole isn't open. There's no communication. But there's no moisture rising from the production colony up into the new box because you don't want any more moisture than they've got already. And they don't need all that heat. You know, we used to think at first it's the heat. That's why they're wintering. It's because of that heat coming up from underneath. Well, how come when tracheal mites were so bad and half our bees were dying, that the production colony down below would be dead and both nukes would be alive? They didn't get much heat, did they? So it's not the heat, it's the fact that they're up out of the snow is what I think it is. So here's the nuke box, and there's the entrance. And when I first, the first number of years that I did this, I would have icicles in the middle of the winter coming out of that hole, coming out of that entrance. There's foam on top, so that insulates the top, so you don't get condensation on the bag dripping on, or on the inner cover dripping on bees. So you get condensation on the side walls, and it runs down and out the entrance and freezes as an icicle. And there's frost inside the hive, inside the nuke box, and it's moisture that kills your bees in the winter. It's not the cold that kills your bees in the winter. So you don't want a, a high moisture um, environment. You want the moisture to escape from the hive as water vapor, not to condense within the hive. So when I, once I drill three quarter inch holes in each nuke box, in each cavity, on the opposite end from the entrance. So there's the entrance, and there's the upper entrance. Now, yet now I have a nice airflow carrying the water vapor out that hole and gone. No more icicles. So the upper entrance is an important thing. I tried for years, I fretted, excuse me, for years. How am I going to make an upper entrance? There's no inner cover. Webster tells me, oh, the, the bags act like a wick. Obviously, they don't act like a wick because there's ice signals coming out of the entrance. So I finally, I bit the bullet and I drilled holes in my eyes. I hate drilling holes in my boxes, on my nice, beautiful boxes. You know, I drilled holes in all of them, but it worked so there's no more moisture problem. So then we wrap them. The bottom hive has the wrapper on it already. We put the, uh, put the new box on top, and then we give them another wrapper. It's just a piece of tar paper, 78 inches long, folded in half and creased the long way, and cut along the crease. 
So it's just a half width piece of tar paper, 78 inches long, wrapped around. And, it, and, it's, and it's wrapped, um, it comes up just below the, the, the foam. So when you put the cover on, it doesn't squash it down. Tie all the covers down, put a stall on top, ready for winter. Now the two-story oaks, you can leave them right on their high stand for the winter. There's the high stand. There's the two-story oak box. That's a two-story oak box with a bag. That's the one I told you about that, that it's only got, this is a two-story oak. This is a one-story oak. Here's that one-story oak's upper entrance. I just filled it up with shavings. That acts like the insulation. That's the insulation for that oak. Then I put a piece of styrofoam on top of it. That's the insulation for the other oak. And I wrap it with that same piece of tar paper. Put the cover on, tuck the tar paper up under the cover, and tie the cover down. And that's a nook yard with two story nooks. And there's the production yard right over there. So there's 25 nooks, uh, 25 production colonies, and 50 nucleus colonies in the same yard. No lifting on that truck? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what hell is for. Okay, me. <laughs> that's all you said that. <laughs> they know. <laughs> and that's how I look at those. And this is a, a yard of single story books wintering on top of production lines all wrapped up. In fact, some of these, like this one, has two new boxes on top of one production line. So there's the production line from there down. And here's a new box from there to there, and there's another new box from there to there. So there's actually four nucleus colonies wintering in that one stack. A production colony and four nucleus colonies. They winter fine. And there's only one piece of foam there. The one piece of foam is on top of that production of that nucleus colony. The foam for the production colony is the second new. That's the insulation for the for the production colony. And the, and the insulation for that new is that new. They all have their own little upper entrances. So what's the point of all this? Does anybody here keep these before trade room lights? One, two, only two, three, only three, four. Only four people here kept these before trade room lights. Do you think keeping these back then before trade room lights was more fun than it is now? Isn't it? Yes. Yes. Come on, Helen, you think it was. You just lost all your bees. You know it was more fun then. What did you have to do to your bees back then? You know, you might have terramized them in the spray. You might have done your spray work and done a little requeening and reversing or whatever. You know, you put supers on and you took supers off. Yes. And you put them away for a bit for winter. You set them a little in the spray in the fall so they had enough. They didn't. And you put them away for, for winter. And the next spring you unpack them and you and you set them if they needed it, then you terramize them if you did it, and you reverse them if you did it, and you put supers on and you took supers on. You did a little requeening and wasn't it fun? It's not so much fun anymore. You know, we used to catch swarms. Catching swarms is fun. I love catching swarms. I haven't caught a swarm in years. <laughs> well that one may keep it. You know, I mean, look at my, my pups here. They, they only know one word. They only know the F word. The F word meaning fun. All you gotta do is say fun. They're ready to go. You know, you guys aren't keeping bees for money. You guys aren't trying to make a living at this. You're trying to have fun in this. Is it fun to have your bees die and have to buy more of those damn packages? <laughs> that die and you have to buy more damn packages, that's not fun. Oh my. Would, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you like to, wouldn't you like to be able to um, buy mom that new rug? <laughs> and wouldn't you like to send your baby daughter to college next year? That's fun. Uh, that's fun. Replacing your dead face isn't fun. Self-sufficiency is what makes it fun. You just don't understand about growing your own bees and growing your own queens. Do you know how cool it is to grow your own queens? 
There is nothing more fun than growing your own queens, growing your own bees. You know, it's like proud pup. It's so much fun. It's the coolest part of beekeeping. It's even cooler than making a big honey crop. It's way more fun than anything else in beekeeping. So do it. But you don't have to do the same thing that, that we've been told all our careers to do with our bees. By packages, by clean, da da da. You can go your own way. You know, forever and ever and ever. The ducks, did you ever see the ducks? Don't they always go the same way? Don't, doesn't the back duck have its nose stuck in the butt of the front duck and they're just, they're just, they're like sheep. They're not ducks, they're sheep. And they're just following each other to wherever. They don't even know where they're going. But what about this guy? This is the smart duck. There's the smart duck. The smart duck is going to go say, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, there's another direction. We don't all have to go that way that mom showed us. We can go back the other way. We can try something new. We can start raising our own bees. We can start having fun again. So that's what it's all about to me. Are there any questions? Go ahead. 
VSH. Yes. I've been adding VSHBs to my stock since 2004. And uh, I do have quite a bit of experience with VSHBs. And I think it's a good trade. Um, <clears throat> you can't just buy VSH queens and put them in your hive and think that's the end of it. Because the whole neighborhood is non-VSH. So it takes years. So I started in 2004. I just had somebody write me um, this winter and say he was doing mite counts. And the VSHBs had two mite counts, two, and the non-VSHBs had 15. So they are keeping their, the population down by removing large pupae that have mites in them. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect yet. Are the bees ready to go without treatments? I don't think the bees are ready to go without treatments yet. But they're getting better. My bees are going farther into the fall before I think they need a treatment. You know, I used to be I worried about getting my honey off the time before the bees died. Now I can get my honey off and go all the way into September before I start to see any deformed wing bodies. So it's definitely helping. And I would go for it. I mean, if you can get that stock, start using it. Those were Apis Dan ships from probably 1980 something. Do you rotate your treatment at all? What do you use? Um, am I allowed to say? Uh, I, I use Amitraz. Do you know what Amitraz is? Okay, Amitraz is a, um, an agricultural lifestyle that is very effective and doesn't leave residues in the wax. If you look at um, Jennifer Berry's talk, and she has the, the spreadsheet. She has all the, the mitocytes and the agricultural chemis, chemicals here, and then she's got what they found in the wax and what the LD50 is and like that. You get to the Amitraz line, and what did the Amitraz line say? Not detectable. So it doesn't build up in the wax. You might get some metabolites, but it works very well. It's a very effective mitocyte if you need a mitocyte. Shouldn't you throw Amitraz in your beehives just, just in case? No. Should you work on on improving your stock so they need less treatments? Yes. Should you hesitate to treat your bees if they're if they're, if it's getting out of hand? I don't think so. I think it's for a purpose. I don't think it's for you know anything else. Thanks a lot.